I want us to I want to warn us against one mistake that's easy to make. Some people say, Oh, the Lord of the Rings, he was conservative and he and we've got these evil powers, and it was during World War II. And so I bet this is like an allegory. Sauron uh, is maybe Hitler or, may, or maybe Stalin or maybe the two combined and all the good guys are England and America. <gasps> the Eagles, that's the U.S. coming in. Yes. Uh, he said he didn't like allegory. Welcome to the Acton Vault podcast, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Eric Cohn, executive producer. Anyone who has read The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings can gather that their author hated tyranny, but few know that the novelist who once described himself as a hobbit, quote, in all but size, was, even by hobbit standards, a zealous proponent of economic freedom and small government. There is a growing concern among many that the West is sliding into political, economic, and moral bankruptcy. In his beloved novels of Middle-earth, J.R.R. Tolkien has drawn us a map to freedom. Several books ably explore how Tolkien's Catholic faith informed his fiction. But none had centered on how his passion for liberty and limited government also shaped his work, or how this passion grew directly from his theological vision of man and creation. The Hobbit Party fills this void. Jonathan Witt and Jay Richards Bring to the Hobbit Party a combined expertise in literary studies, political theory, economics, philosophy, and theology. You can find additional resources in the show notes for this episode, as well as previous episodes on our website at acton.org slash podcast. And if you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Acted Vault is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. It was about 25, we're coming up on 25 years uh, since Acton began. It was also about 25 years ago, or almost 25 years ago, that uh, the forces of Soviet communism were sputtering to an end the forces of freedom and democracy were gaining strength in Moscow and the the Soviet uh, power structure had collapsed. And of course something with that much raw power that had been around that long isn't just going to go gently into the night. And so there there was a counteroffensive. The tanks were trying to roll back into Moscow and retake Moscow. And the freedom fighters were set up, began to set up barricades all around the city to stop the the tanks and and hold on to this tenuous moment of freedom uh, that had just barely begun to take root. And at one of the barricades, a banner was thrown up, a banner with a a freedom statement on it. Now, I want you to just let's take a moment and try to guess what, if if you were one of those Russian freedom fighters, what you might have put on that Banner. I can imagine it might have been, you know, a, a quote from Thomas Paine. It could have been uh, something from, you know, one of the other American founders. It might have been uh, something from the, the great uh, Russian novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky, who was a, a vigorous opponent of totalitarianism. Uh, they might, might have drawn from one of the ancients, you know, a, a quote from Cato. Uh, I can think of several possibilities. But what did the, what did the, uh, the banner read? It read, Frodo is with us. Frodo is with us. And that should give even a a fan of of the Lord of the Rings and and the Hobbit pause. You know, was this, was this freedom fighter, had he, you know, was he into the Hobbit and into mushrooms and he'd gotten the wrong kind of mushrooms? Um, Was he smoking the wrong kind of pipe weed? Why, of all the different things you could put on a banner, why Frodo is with us? Well, there's another part of that backstory the Lord of the Rings was banned in so- the Soviet Union. And yet, a bootleg, a bad Russian translation bootleg copy uh, made its way around, mimeograph copy, multiplied and made its way around Russia. And so there was this kind of the underground cult following of Tolkien in faraway Russia. So you have this middle class, West Midlands reared, ing- you know, pipe smoking, mild mannered, Oxford professor Englishman 
who is a, is a cult hero in faraway Soviet Russia. What is the connection? And this was a fantasy novel after all. I mean, couldn't, why weren't they drawing upon you know, greedy novels of realism or Solzhenitsyn, who undoubtedly did have a powerful influence? Why, in this case, Frodo is with us? Well, I can't speak uh, with expertise to uh, the underground workings of uh, the Russian freedom fighters, but I can speak, and that's what we're going to focus on uh, this afternoon, focus on what they may have found in the Lord of the Rings, uh, in Middle Earth, in Tolkien's world, that would have resonated with them, inspired them, encouraged them. A little, little more about Tolkien. I mentioned he was a professor uh, at Oxford University. He fought in World War I, uh, as, as C.S. Lewis did as well. He was uh, friends with C.S. Lewis. He was friends with W.H. Auden there at Oxford University. Of course, he had a, um, ample opportunity to rub el elbows with a number of prominent intellectuals. He lost uh, both his parents in childhood, so he did not have, you, you picture this ivory tower professor, but he actually had some, some serious hard knocks in his life. He lost all but one of his friends in the trenches of World War I. He fought in the Battle of the Somme. Uh, his uh, novels were fairly popular from right when they came out. Uh, the Hobbit uh, did well in the 30s, then when The Lord of the Rings came out, it struggled a little bit because it was this single large volume novel at a time when paper prices were expensive, but it still did fairly well. And then it took off in the 60s in the United States when a cheap paperback came out. And it became very popular with uh, college students. And in, and, in, and in an irony that I'll explore a little bit more as we go, it was embraced by the hippie generation. You know, and again, I joked about uh, mushrooms and pipeweed. Well, they saw, you know, there's these hobbits and the elves and they hang out in the woods and they they eat mushrooms, and, and they wear, you know, natural clothing, and, and, so they, and so they embraced it, and they thought, yeah, Tolkien, he's one of us, and Tolkien in some of his letters was kind of chagrined, he's like, I am not a hippie, uh, and if you look even a little bit closely, you see themes of traditionalism, which was, definitely, it was absolutely not a, a, a hippie value. Uh, there was a, a high view of absolute morality, so you don't kind of, do make it up as you go. Uh, there was a, a, a just war doctrine uh, that, that, yes, war is ugly and to be avoided if it can be, but there are times when war is just and needs to be pursued for the greater good, uh, which also would have run uh, contrary to a lot of the 60s uh, anti-war hippie uh, sentiment. And so there were some critics on the left that saw Tolkien and understood that he was a conservative and that conservative things ran through his novels and they were chagrined, and they looked for ways to marginalize Tolkien, look for ways to um, demean him, uh, and that didn't work. The, the novels, the, the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings are the number three and the number two all-time best-selling novels now in, in any language, so their attempts to marginalize him didn't go well. Uh, but they thought, well, we can at least make him not respected, and so some of them attacked him uh, on his literary merit. Others, a, a bolder sort, tried to co-opt Tolkien. You know, there was already the confusion with the hippies, and yeah, they were probably high on something when they were confused about Tolkien, but there seemed to be an opportunity there to co-opt Tolkien. And so since then, there's been a lot of confusion, I either uh, unfair attacks on Tolkien's literary reputation. He, he wasn't, by the way, just a, a guy kind of making it up as he goes uh, in his basement. Uh, he was, as I said, a renowned... Uh, professor at Oxford, uh, a philologist who had a deep understanding of, of, of history and of languages, and that informed his, his work. You would think, given how prominent the political themes are in, in Tolkien, that much would have been written about it. But for whatever reason, perhaps the, 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 his creating a whole um, secondary world has, has dominated in people's minds. Maybe he did such a good job. He, did, he didn't want to be a didactic novelist like, like Ayn Rand. Maybe he did such a good job of that that people have not paid as much attention to the, the important pol political themes that are there. The, uh, the uh, Catholic literary critic Joseph Pierce, he commented that there's been some written about Tolkien on his political views, but not much of it's very good. Ironically, we take issue with some of uh, Joseph Pierce's uh, views on Tolkien's political views, but that's probably a, another lecture for another time. 
But what we, when I, when I began to I read that quote from Pierce years ago, and I had been thinking about Tolkien's political views, I thought, you know, there's a, there's a book here. And so Jay and I got together, and we were able to convince Ignatius to walk out on the ice with us, and the Hobbit party is the result. So I want to take, uh, take some time to not capture every chapter, every element of the Hobbit party, but hit a few of the high points. Okay, the first place you can go to see that Tolkien was a conservative, he was committed to limited government, to small government, is to his collected letters. There it's pretty explicit. Um, here, let me give you just a two or three quotes, and there are others that we explore in the book. My political opinions lean more and more to anarchy, philosophically understood, meaning abolition of control, not whiskered men with bombs. The most improper job of any man, even saints, is bossing other men. Not one in a million is fit for it, and least of all, those who seek the opportunity. This is in a letter he wrote to one of his sons. In another letter, uh, he, he said, if we could get back to personal names, it would do a lot of good. Government is an abstract noun, meaning the art and process of governing. And it should be an offense to write it with a capital G so as to refer to people. If people were in the habit of referring to King George's council, Winston and his gang, there he's referring to Winston Churchill, even though Tolkien was a conservative party member, he had some issues with Winston Churchill when he didn't think Churchill was you know, small government enough. If we could get back to referring to these specific individuals, it would go a long way to clearing thought and reducing the frightful landslide into theocracy. He did not like, he did not like the idea of a, of a faceless, imagining this faceless, benign, all-wise government. He wanted you thinking about the particular fallible human beings running your government. He was, no, he was no friend of socialism. He wrote, and this was a letter to his son Christopher. Christopher was the one that took, took, kind of followed in his literary footsteps and compiled the, the Silmarillion and, and did a lot of other work on Tolkien's posthumous material. He wrote to him while Christopher was, was in the war. And so, so imagine his son is in, there, is in the Royal Air Force. Uh, he's being threatened by uh, the Nazis. And yet look what he says about the different sides of, of the war. The saints are those who have for all their imperfections never finally bowed heart and will to the world or the evil spirit in modern but not universal terms, mechanism, scientific materialism, socialism in either of its actions now at war. In either of its actions now at war. And if you go into his letters, you know, what is he talking about? Is he talking about not, you know, the, the Nazi socialism and... Communist socialism? I think he was referring to both of those, but if you look at his letters, he was also referring to the socialism, the democratic socialism, the soft socialism that was ascendant uh, among the Western European powers as well. And he probably would have said, you know, with FDR, you know, New Deal programs in America. The world or the evil spirit... Okay, that's, you know, we think, well, Tolkien was a moderate. He wasn't very political. He's referring to socialism as the evil spirit. So I, I like to push back when people say, well, he was probably just a moderate. Uh, no, I, I, think he was, I think he was right, and I think he had great insight. But to uh, imagine he was like, oh, he was kind of in between the conservative and the labor party. He was in between the Republicans and the Democrats. No, he probably thought the U.S. Republicans of the day would have been way too into cronyism. Uh, and the Labor Party and the Democrats on the left would have been you know, way off into socialism land. Uh, so he was hi highly committed to, to limited government. Well, what about the novels themselves, though? I mean, it's one thing to go to his letters and see him saying particular things, but the novels are different. Sometimes novelists convey, embody truths that they might uh, not even consciously be aware of, that perhaps run contrary to their official positions. But I think as we dig into his novels, we see him reinforcing and enriching these, these insights, these positions we see in his letters. There was something, to put it another way, there was something that those Russian freedom fighters found in the Lord of the Rings. They weren't just imagining it. I want, us to, I want to warn us against one mistake that's easy to make. Some people say, oh, the Lord of the Rings, he was conservative, and, he, and we've got these evil powers, and it was during World War II, and so I bet this is like an allegory. Sauron uh, is maybe Hitler, or, may, or maybe Stalin, or maybe the two combined, and all the good guys are England and America. <gasps> the Eagles, that's the U.S. 
coming in. Yes. Uh, he said he didn't like allegory. Uh, he, he resisted. And he said he carefully tried to avoid allegory. But he, but he allowed that there was applicability in his novels. In other words, you, you could find applications to everyday life. If he's writing truly about human nature, about the human condition, about you know, insights into society down through the ages, you should be able to find applications in, in any good work, as you would in, in Shakespeare, Dostoevsky, and, and Tolkien. So he says, that's legitimate. So that's what we're going to do here. We're not going to look for some neat point-for-point -point allegory. Uh, we're going to look for some applications to, to real life. Okay, when, you, when you go to the Lord of the Rings, and we'll, we'll talk a little about The Hobbit too, there's a, uh, there's a bookend uh, effect in that novel that critiques big government. The critique at the early part of the novel is the Shire in its healthy state. Okay, near the end of the novel is the Shire when it's being overrun by some big government thugs. So we're going to look at both those, but I want to start by looking at the positive small government side. When you go... Uh, you start reading The Lord of the Rings, if you don't skip the prologue, you actually read the prologue about hobbits and all that, and if you're a Tolkien geek, you inevitably do read all that. He describes, it's, it's partly, the prologue's partly there for people that hadn't read The Hobbit. The Hobbit's the prelude to The Lord of the Rings. And so he briefly describes the Shire and what hobbits are. Hobbits are, are short little uh, human-like creatures with uh, fur on their feet, leathery feet. They like to eat six meals a day. They live uh, underground, but in nice homes. They're not like rabbit holes. They have round doors and have all the amenities. Uh, he doesn't use the word Victorian uh, England, but if you start, you know, going point for point, you know, like they have tea time, they have uh, s certain meals similar to it. So it's very much pulled out of that world. Uh, and, uh, and it's very limited government. He says in the prologue, the Shire had hardly any government. And it's not chaos, it's not anarchy, uh, but it's a very, very limited government, very small government. There are no department, there's no department of education. There's no, no uh, government entities lining up school children in geometric rows in government schools. Uh, there's, there are no, uh, there are, there are no uh, he heavy regulations. You know, I have a section in the, in the book talking about how fussy the regulations are uh, in, in Greater Grand Rapids for having laying hens in your backyard. Gently clucking, by the way, if you're very city-fied, Hens don't cock-a-doodle-doo at five in the morning. Uh, that may have been what killed it. They're like, oh, I don't want roosters crowing. And, uh, they tried to get laying hens in the city of Grand Rapids, and it failed. I think eventually it came back, and they got, as long as you're, all your neighbors are okay with you having gently clucking, three gently clucking laying hens in your backyard. They, they can not be okay with it and have three loud dogs, like my dog Daisy, which sounds like a foghorn when she barks. I, I love her, but uh, it's true. But that's just one of, of countless examples of just how regulated, how comfortable we've got with regulating each other. But in the Shire, you'd have nothing of that sort. You know, you wouldn't, it's, it's hard to imagine who would be the government entity that would come in and make that trouble. There are sheriffs uh, who go around uh, trying to keep the peace, but they mainly are about finding stray farm animals that uh, may be grazing on somebody else's grass and moving them back to the original owner. So they're protecting private property twice over when they do that. So it's, a, it's an image of, of limited government. Tolkien was clearly, from his letters, from just the way he treats and describes, sorry, he was clearly very fond of the place. It's been one of the places that's most resonated with re readers and lovers of, of Middle Earth. So there's something there uh, that's resonated with uh, Tolkien readers. And, and, and I think it goes back to the, this, this limited government, small government vision that we've lost in many ways in the West. If you want an image of capitalism, some form of, of capitalism, in anything like its modern uh, form, you need to go to a section of The Hobbit, a late section of The Hobbit. And The Hobbit, again, is the prelude to The Lord of the Rings, uh, where Bilbo and the 13 dwarves have journeyed over hill and under mountain, and they've finally gotten to their destination. They're trying to kill a dragon and get back the stolen treasure uh, that the dwarves lost long ago. And some people say, well, this dragon, he is a classic greedy capitalist. He's got all this wealth and he hoards it. And there's been, there's been uh, critics on the left that have pointed that. Oh, here's Tolkien criticizing capitalism. But that misreads uh, Tolkien. It misreads capitalism. This greedy dragon, he's not an entrepreneur. He's not a capitalist. He doesn't invest 
his wealth. He didn't earn any of the wealth. He stole it all, and he took it in, and he sat on it. Uh, there, there's a great section in uh, Michael Novak. I think it's in the de- uh, Spirit of Democratic Capitalism. When he teases apart, he says you, you, you shouldn't confuse the aristocrat in European history with the bourgeois. They typically were bourgeois, uh, the entrepreneurs that rose up through the ranks. You know, once there was enough stability and political and economic freedom uh, in Europe to start having that rising artisan uh, trading middle class. It says that the aristocrats were actually kind of very down on capitalism and, and, and markets and, and, and trade uh, because it threatened their power position. Uh, they tended to have inherited wealth. They tended to you know, primarily sit on their wealth uh, and just live off that wealth. Whereas it was the scrappy uh, bourgeois entrepreneurs that were rising up and creating wealth. So smog is more of a picture of an aristocrat. And if you read uh, Thomas Shippey, who, uh, who sat in the chair, not the physical chair, but the position that Tolkien had at Oxford as a philologist, he has a great study in uh, Tolkien, the author of the century, uh, about the language of smog. Smog can speak. And, and, and he points out how he, he comes across as a 20th century aristocrat. Uh, he, he has that cynicism, his diction. Uh, so so he's, not, he's, he's not a middle-class bourgeois capitalist. He's a miser. And we see a little of that in Thorin Oakenshield, the leader of the dwarves. Uh, he gets struck by gold fever, and he just wants to possess the gold and sit on it. Uh, he doesn't want to build relationships and trade. Well, what becomes of Lake Town and, the, and the, uh, this treasure under the mountain? This mountain is, you know, looms over Lake Town and the destroyed city of Dale that the dragon destroyed. What becomes of that place? Well, fortunately, Bilbo, uh, the hobbit, the principal hobbit in, of the title, uh, is not greedy. And he thinks it's terrible that Thorin has gotten this gold fever and he's starting to fight and bicker with the elves uh, and the men of Lake Town. And he tries to broker a peace. And then Gandalf also shows up. He's the wise wizard that guided him through much of the journey. He also sees, this is crazy. Thorin has lost his mind. Uh, he's full of greed. They're able to delay a battle between the men and the dwarves and the elves, which should never have happened. They're able to delay it just long enough that another force comes in, the evil orcs. And so then the humans and the elves and the dwarves rally together and realize, okay, we hate each other, but we hate these orcs worse, and we're all going to be wiped out if we don't get together. And they come together, and they fight, and are able to uh, just barely defeat the orcs. Thorin is killed. He repents of his dragon fever evil uh, and dies. And what happens after that is a peace is brokered. And and the spirit of Bilbo and and, uh, Gandalf, which was much more trusting, much more generous, much more willing to, to, to risk things uh, emotionally, to build those relationships, that spirit takes root among those people, among the elves and the men of uh, Dale and the men of Lake Town and and the dwarves. Uh, A wiser dwarf ends up uh, taking over after that. And so they have all this trust and generosity. So what happens to that? Do we get a communist utopia? You know, that would be if Tolkien were kind of socialist and left, everybody would be giving and sharing. There wouldn't be any kind of, you know, they wouldn't have like evil trade and capitalism. Well, Bilbo later learns, is right at the end of The Hobbit, and we get some more details about this in The Lord of the Rings, trade, enterprise expands in that river valley. And this is an insight, and I don't know if you, if you had quizzed Tolkien, if he would have consciously got this right. He may have, but he's conveying an insight that even many defenders of capitalism don't understand. And that is that capitalism, or the, the free economy, the market economy, benefits and is based on a measure of trust and generosity. Okay, it's not greed is good. I, Ayn Rand was wrong there. So I think Tolkien actually understood something about market economies and wealth creation that um, he understood it better than, than Ayn Rand, and he conveys that through uh, The Hobbit. The master of Lake Town, you're like, well, that, that guy, is, he's a capitalist and he's greedy. Well, think, of, think about him, though. He's, the ma- he's basically the mayor. He's like the head figure in Lake Town. He's also the head businessman. I mean, can you get more crony-ish, crony form of capitalism than your head businessman is also your head politician? And he has tolls. In the movie, they even tease this out uh, a little bit more than even in the books. Uh, the uh, bard is trying to do just an honest business up and down the river, but the, the, the tolls and the regulations are, make it almost impossible for him to. 
And this is all so that the mayor of Lake Town can, can get wealthier and wealthier. He eventually gets dragon sickness and, <laughs> and runs off and tries to steal some gold and dies in the uh, cold winter uh, wilderness. Uh, so he is not the picture of a healthy capitalism, but of a sick capitalism. What comes after that picture of a healthy capitalism, uh, that I think is what Tolkien is pointing to. You need some trust, you need some generosity, but trade, wealth creation, those are good things. Great, and there, there's Bard, sh shamelessly borrowing some pictures from the movies, even though I have some problems with particularly these recent set of movies. There are other people, we could go on and look at other peoples, other lands that teach us insights about what Tolkien thought about freedom, about uh, w what the just and free society looks like. Uh, we don't have time to do that in this lecture, so you'll have to buy the book uh, for that. <laughs> now I want to transition uh, not to a pl another place, but to a thing. The, the ring, and I'm very proud of that little uh, rhyme there, by the way, thing, ring, so please take note. The ring of power, this is the one ring to rule them all. In The Hobbit, it's just an invisibility ring. Bilbo comes across it, there's this Gollum character that's really angry about losing it. Clearly, it has some sort of dark component to it, because Bilbo starts lying a little bit when he has it. Uh, Gandalf's a little bit concerned, but it's, it's mainly just a prop to give Bilbo some um, a capacity to do some things and save the day in ways he wouldn't have otherwise. But when you get to the Lord of the Rings, they discover that this ring, this invisibility ring, this magic ring, was forged by the evil Lord Sauron, who's the, the necromancer in The Hobbit. He's like the, the arch enemy of Middle Earth. And he forged it, not just so he could be invisible and go around and you know, steal things you know, from the local record shop or whatever, they didn't have record shops back then, but so he could ensnare the free peoples of Middle Earth, because if you're a wizard and you have, you have power and you know what you're doing, you can use this ring to do far more than just be invisible. Uh, he wants to dominate the wills of the free people of Middle Earth. So in, in, in a lot of ways, you could think of this, this ring as embodying Lord Acton's dictum that power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Because what happens to anybody that tries to keep the ring, even if they imagine they're gonna do good with it? It eats away at your soul thins you, corrupts you. We see, see Gollum, who's already somewhat corrupt, getting worse and worse and worse. We see Bilbo, it's starting to have a negative effect on him. He's finally, it was like the one person in the history of the ring that was able to, to freely give it up. And the hobbits are, are seen as kind of models of, of, of humility. They're not perfect. And so I think it's indicative that Bilbo, the humble hobbit, is, is able, with, with some urging from Gandalf, to get rid of the ring. He gives it to Frodo, and then Frodo is tasked with the other wise figures of Middle-earth, not to take the ring and use it as a powerful weapon against Sauron, but to get rid of it, to destroy it. And there's only one place they can do that. So what begins is, is a kind of anti-quest. They're not going to get some treasure. They're going to get rid of a treasure. And you can see this as a rebuke to 20th century politics. That's, that's all about trying to aggrandize more and more power to the state. Here we have... Aragorn, who's supposed to be, you know, the future king. We have Gandalf, this powerful wizard. We have Galadriel, this powerful elf, uh, elven uh, lord. All saying, no, let's not use the ring. Let's get rid of it. Let's get rid of this ring of power. And, and some of the quotes that we have from some of these wise uh, figures are very telling. At one point, Frodo asked Gandalf to take the ring. He's like, Gandalf, imagine the good you could do with this ring. Gandalf cries, no. He springs to his feet. With that power, I should have power too great and terrible. And over me, the ring would gain a power still greater and more deadly. I do not wish to become like the Dark Lord himself. Yet the way of the ring to my heart is by pity, pity for weakness and the desire of strength to do good. Do not tempt me. Later, Frodo, who has the same bright idea, and he tries to offer it to Galadriel, who's this very good and powerful uh, elf princess. Well, not a princess, but she, she's a lord. Uh, and she's, wow, she's already powerful. She had the ring. She could do some good. Here's, here's, and she gives him this vision. This is what, not what she normally looks like uh, in the book or in the movies. But she gives him this a vision of what might happen if she took the ring and tried to use it for good. And she's very, in the scene, the way it's played in the book and in, and in the movie, she's, she's tempted. The ring exerts an enormous tempting power for even these wise figures. She says, now at last it comes, she says. You will give me the ring freely. In place of the dark lord, you will set up a queen. And I shall not be dark, but beautiful and terrible 
as the morning and the night, fair as the sea and the sun and the snow upon the mountain, dreadful as the storm and the lightning, stronger than the foundations of the earth. All shall love me and despair. So it's a vision of total political power, but total political power in the service of the common good. And yet, Tolkien is having his wisest characters say, no, you don't want to go there. We don't want to go there. She lifted up her hand, and from the ring that she wore, this is another ring, there issued a great light that illumined her alone and left all else dark. She stood before Frodo, seeming now tall beyond measure and beyond beautiful, beyond enduring, terrible and worshipful. Okay, and then she kind of goes back to herself. And then she let her hand fall, and the light faded, and suddenly she laughed again, and lo, she was shrunken, a slender elf woman, clad in simple white, whose gentle voice was soft and sad. I passed the test, she said. I will diminish and go into the west and remain Galadriel. So there was this moral test that she sees herself passing. She was offered the ring, this ring of power, this corrupting ring, but she didn't take it. She did the hard thing and passed up that opportunity to use unlimited political power, absolute political power for good. Later, Sam Gamgee, Frodo's faithful companion, he was thinking, you know, he, he wasn't privy to all this, and he also has the idea, oh yeah, let's have, let's have Galadriel use it. And, she, and he says, but if you'll pardon me speaking out, I think my master was right. I wish you'd take his ring. You'd put things to rights. You'd stop them digging up the gaffer. That's his dad. And turning him adrift. He's worried about what's going to happen to the Shire. He's had a vision of the Shire being overrun by the forces of evil. And he's like, if you had the ring, you could stop them. You'd make some folks pay for their dirty work. I would, she said. That is how it would, it would begin. But it would not stop with that, alas. So then we have the logic of... Saruman that's eerily similar to the good Sam's logic. Saruman was leagued in league with the good uh, forces of power, but he's gradually corrupted. And just before he breaks with Gandalf, he's trying to convince Gandalf, help me find the one ring and we'll use it for good. We must have power, power to order all things, he tells Gandalf, as we will for that good which only the wise can see. So we're wise enough to use that ring for good, and we can help all our smaller, less wise friends. We'll guide them. Of course, Gandalf is a gas. The wise Gandalf is a gas, and that's shortly before that they have the the break, and Saruman becomes a, a pawn of Sauron uh, through the rest of the the books. The lesson is old and often forgotten. Even well-intentioned leaders are tempted to annex to themselves more and more power in their efforts to fight evil or improve the lot of people. In such cases, the, the danger, oh, well, you know, power could gradually corrupt you and you could have too much power, and that seems all very abstract and distant. Whereas the, the good you could do, and we, we've had our current president uh, occasionally, I don't, I don't know if the cameras are off or he just didn't care, he, he seemed to kind of pine for a, a, a simpler form of, of government where there weren't all these checks and balances by these silly American founders in the way so we could get some good done. Uh, it's, it's the perennial temptation uh, of a, a politician, even those that are, are seeking the good. So we have the ring of Sarn. We also have the eye of Sarn. The eye of Sarn, if you haven't read the book, you're like, what are you talking about? He's got this one weird eye, but it's, it's actually, it's kind, of a, it's kind of a medieval magical technology. It has this giant kind of, I won't say all-seeing eye, but it can see a great deal up in a tower. And, and he, he alone can see through it and, and peer to all parts of, uh, the kingdom. And he, he also has uh, birds and, and these giant winged Nazgul that help do spying for him. And he's got orcs and other spies. He's, in a lot of ways, he's trying to, to recreate something like what Jerry, Jeremy Bentham in the 19th century described as a panopticon. Anybody familiar with a panopticon? Okay, it's this, this watchtower, this beautifully, in his mind, uh, designed watchtower where the, wa the watcher can't be seen. You know, now we would use something like two-way mirrors. The watcher can see all the prisoners from that one spot, but they can't see him. They don't even know if he's there or not. So that's the, that's the perfect way to exert power. And what we find Tolkien exploring uh, in Middle-earth is, is a Sauron attempting to create an entire panoptican society. If he could get the ring, he would both be completely invisible and he would have these spies, and he'd have the eye of Sauron, 
and he would create this panopticon, all-controlling society. And clearly, it's exactly what the, uh, what the, uh, the, the freedom fighters, Aragorn and Frodo and, and the other uh, Fellowship of the Ring folks, are wanting to stop. I don't wanna, we're, we're almost out of time, and I don't want to leave the sense that all of Tolkien's critiques were directed at the hardest form of socialism in the novels. We see late in the, the Lord of the Rings, a, a very curious chapter, because in a lot of ways you think that if the novel's over, they're just going to get home and have a party. They get all the way back to the Shire, and some guy named Sharky has taken over, and a lot of his thugs, and it turns out Sharky is Saruman. Remember, Saruman's kind of the number two bad guy who turned to evil. He's, uh, after being overthrown in his uh, Orthanc Tower, he slinks his way to the Shire, and oh, I'll make trouble there in a smaller, mean kind of way. But they don't say, we're evil tyrants, and we're going to be mean to you. They're there uh, as gatherers and sharers. They come and gather and share, and they take it off for fair distribution. And so what's upended is a, a society that respected private property. There was this beautiful shire where you had some people that were wealthier than others. It, it wasn't a communist society. You have the Tooks and the Brandy Bucks, and Bilbo were quite wealthy, and then you had other people that were poor. They were getting by. It was a healthy society, but there was clearly uh, a lack of equality. But then you have these gatherers and sharers come in to make everything fair, and they take over. And as the hobbits move through, excuse me, as they move through and they're getting back, what they see, you know, breaks their hearts. The, the, uh, the beauty and the, uh, the craftsmanship that went into the individual properties uh, is gone. As they trot along and the sun began to sink towards the white downs far away on the western horizon, they came to Bywater by its wide pool. And there they had their first really painful shock. This was Frodo and Sam's own country, and they found out now that they cared about it more than any other place in the world. Many of the houses they had known were missing. Some seemed to have been burned down. The pleasant row of old hobbit holes in the bank of the north side of the pool were deserted, and their little gardens that used to run down to the water's edge were rank with weeds. So that ownership culture has been upended, and it's going to seed. Now, he may have had partially in mind, as he painted this picture, hard socialism. But from his, from his letters and, and other indicators, he also had in mind uh, the soft European democratic socialism that he saw eroding and impoverishing the culture of uh, the Western European powers. Uh, here's how the, uh, in the Tolkien Encyclopedia, there's, there's a great quote that, that brings home what might have been in view. And it's by Hal Kolbatch. If any of you read The American Spectator, you may have occasionally seen his works. But there in the Tolkien Encyclopedia, he writes, it is easy to believe that the drab, joyless, coercive, and destructive order set up by Sharky, that's Saruman, in the Shire under gangs of bullying gatherers and sharers, which if successful would have turned it into a desert, owed much to the drabness, bleakness, and bureaucratic regulation of post-war Britain under the Attlee Labor government. In any case, it's hard to think of a more pointed satire of democratic socialism than having a bunch of gatherers and sharers come in and uh, divide things up for fair distribution. It even says they're not even sure where a lot of it ends up. And anytime you, you know, have the government do uh, some sharing for you, it's amazing how some of it tends to go missing. Tolkien knew that freedom could be overrun suddenly, but that it could also erode gradually. Uh, these Sharky and his men came in and they kind of hoodwinked a lot of the hobbits. There was a little bit of bullying, uh, but a good bit of it was, you know, buying off this wealthy guy here, uh, this you know, person over here, misleading him uh, and getting him to kind of go along. Uh, and then, of course, the, ha the happy news is that when Frodo and, and Sam and uh, a couple others, they show up, Merry and Pippin show up, they, wake, they awaken the Shire. Those freedom-loving hobbits, they awaken them, and, and they're able to, to drive out the uh, Sharky and his thugs. Tolkien worried that we were, uh, in the West, were kind of gradually being, you know, like the proverbial frog in the water, gradually being boiled 
as the gatherers and sharers gain more and more power. He, uh, you know, he, he was anticipated by uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, who a century er earlier worried after his uh, tour of America. He saw much that he admired and he tried to impress upon the French some things that uh, they could copy and benefit from in the American experiment. But he worried that this democratic impulse would be used uh, to lead to what he called uh, soft despotism. He said, I see an innumerable crowd of men, all alike and equal, and above them stands an immense and protective power, which alone is responsible for looking after their enjoyments and watching over their destiny. It is absolute, meticulous, ordered, provident, and kindly disposed. A ruling power that spreads its arms over the whole of society, covering the surface of social life with a network of petty, complicated, detailed, and uniform rules until it reduces each nation to nothing more than a flock of timid and hardworking animals with the government as shepherd. This was Tolkien's fear. He opposed despotism, soft despotism, hard despotism with, with his whole heart and mind. He dedicated uh, much of his literary energies uh, to combating it. We go back, we started this with that picture of the freedom fighters in Russia uh, throwing up the barricades and throwing up the sign, Frodo is with us. I, I think given where our society is today with its growing list of petty, complicated uh, rules, uh, the, the growing number of people that are living off of uh, the government instead of being wealth creators, I think it's time for our society to turn that around and, and ask, are we still with Frodo? I know you are, but go out and ask your neighbor. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at producer at acton.org. Until next week, for Acton Vault, I'm Eric Cohn.